Big news in the world of depression and Alzheimer's disease. Two big papers were published over the past uh, two weeks that I think are definitely worth talking about. Um, with regard to Alzheimer's disease, it was revealed that 16, that 16 years ago, in 2006, a paper in Nature was published that presented fraudulent data that essentially derailed Alzheimer's disease research in many ways and wasted millions of dollars of Alzheimer's disease research funding uh, for data that was essentially made up. And this was a big, um, obviously big news published in uh, Science Magazine. And essentially the crux of the story, which I think people need to know about, is that ever since 1906, when Alzheimer's disease was first coined by physician Alois Alzheimer, when he saw in the brain of a cadaver that the brain of an Alzheimer's, a person who had passed from Alzheimer's disease was riddled with plaques, finding a way to um, reduce the plaque burden in the brain has been the guiding uh, hypothesis um, as to what could potentially cure Alzheimer's disease. And the amyloid hypothesis, as it was called, was that amyloid plaque essentially causes Alzheimer's disease, that this plaque that we see in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease is the cause of the condition. Now, for decades, they really didn't have much, uh, like there, wa there wasn't very much um, efficacy in terms of the treatments to reduce the plaque burden, but nonetheless, that's where all of the research funding and scientific effort went into how can we get rid of the plaque that builds up in the brain and supposedly causes Alzheimer's disease. Because that's what was seen in the cadaver. Right. Of, okay, what's the buildup of plaque in the brain? Right. It's a very seductive uh, idea, right? If you see plaque in, in, if you see this plaque, like the plaque that builds on your teeth, but accumulated around neurons in a diseased brain, a brain that had Alzheimer's disease, it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination, right? It makes logical sense that that plaque could potentially at least play a causal role in the etiology of the, disease, uh, of the disease. But there are so many other cases in biology where you see something at the scene of the crime, whether it's cholesterol in arteries that have become clogged due to atherosclerosis, right, that are actually symptoms of some underlying condition. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it becomes very seductive to um, put, to, to create a bad guy, essentially out of what was essentially seen at right. the scene of the crime, right? Right, we want to cause so Wrongfully we can fix accused, it. clearly there, clearly associated with the condition, but not necessarily causal. And so by 2006, which is, just to back up, the year that this fraudulent paper was published in the journal Nature, which is a very well-respected journal, to be a scientist published in Nature, it's like winning an Academy Award, essentially. Okay. By 2006, research was starting to lose steam because nobody could really uh, pinpoint these plaques to the clinically meaningful symptomology that we see in Alzheimer's disease, meaning memory loss. So it became clear that people who are in old age, but that don't have any cognitive symptoms, also have plaque in the brain. That plaque accumulates as a natural part of aging, perhaps. Mm -hmm. That there is no real correlation between plaque burden in the brain and cognitive dysfunction. So it, became, it was becoming harder and harder and harder to um, reasonably claim that amyloid was causal for Alzheimer's disease because people with amyloid in the brain don't necessarily have Alzheimer's disease. Everybody with Alzheimer's disease has this plaque in the brain. And amyloid and plaque in the brain are synonymous. Right. So it wasn't until the 80s that um, the, the constituent protein that forms these plaques mm -hmm. was given the name amyloid beta. Okay. But the plaques were always composed of this amyloid beta okay. plaque, which is um, basically created via a protein that we all create called amyloid precursor protein. And so scientists were not able to actually connect um, this plaque with cognitive decline, which is like the meaning, the, the, the symptom that robs Alzheimer's patients of who they are, mm -hmm. robs loved ones. Uh, you know, of their family members that have this that have this condition, right? Mm -hmm. So in 2006, one industrious uh, researcher, young researcher, char highly charismatic researcher by the name of Sylvain Lesney, was working in a lab of a woman with a great 
pedigree, scientific pedigree named Karen Ash at the University of Minnesota. And he published this paper in Minnesota claiming to have found a subtype of amyloid beta. Again, this the, the protein that is the backbone of this sort of plaque, right? Mm-hmm. That when injected into a young rat causes profound cognitive deficits. So in 2006, this paper came out and it was like, that's the missing link. We finally found the amyloid beta subtype that's responsible for cognitive decline. This isn't just the plaque that we're seeing. This is like causal in terms of like the memory loss that people experience when they have Alzheimer's disease, right? And so that renewed to a crazy degree um, fervor surrounding this hypothesis, this amyloid hypothesis that amyloid is causal, right? Mm -hmm. The Alzheimer's disease. And so that renewed hope for these researchers that, by the way, at the time were deeply invested in this hypothesis, right? Alzheimer's drug trials, dismal failure, 99.6% fail rate. But nonetheless, we finally found a protein that was um, causally giving these these rats that was causally connected to memory loss, the primary symptom that we want to, um, that we want to, you know, offer viable therapies for Mm -hmm. to our patients. And so millions of dollars of research funding continued to pour um, with renewed zeal into this amyloid hypothesis. Scientists with reputations, you know, continue to go down this avenue. And in tandem with that, anybody who presented an alternate viewpoint was ridiculed because the so-called amyloid mafia, this is a term that they actually used in the Science Magazine article, would come after them. And this actually happened to me. My first project when I was getting started with science communication was a documentary, which I'm still working on, and it's almost finished, mm-hmm. which I'm super excited to uh, to share with the world. Um, back when I was getting started, it had an alternate name than the current name. So the we launched a Kickstarter campaign, and the name of the film was Breadhead, and it sought to explore dementia as a potentially preventable condition, preventable through diet and lifestyle changes, right? Right. And my film was actually attacked. Like there was uh, somebody associated with a... A uh, really awful guy was who was associated with a, a, a an Alzheimer's organization that really served as a funding pipeline for this hypothesis. It was funding scientists that were going down this avenue of this amyloid hypothesis. Really powerful um, personalities, fiercely territorial personalities in science, and uh, and were associated with this organization. And he came out against my project. He sent me a bunch of rude messages on Facebook, and ultimately wrote an, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, disparagingly talking about my film. And quelling hope, quelling any alternative hope, really, outside of this amyloid sort of right. realm, right? It even the the op ed even talked glowingly about a drug that has since come out to a ton of controversy called aducanumab or aduhelm, which was uh, urged by experts on a in an in house panel at the FDA not to be approved because it this drug effectively reduced amyloid plaque in the brain, but didn't improve cognitive symptoms, right? It didn't improve cognitive symptoms. So um, anyway, so we're getting, so I digress, but uh, essentially, so this paper in 2006, it renewed hope for this for this thing. And then uh, recently this, this other drug was approved that was shown to be effective in terms of reducing amyloid burden in the brain, but still was not able to improve cognitive symptoms, right? And this was... 2006. 2006. When, okay. When this paper in Nature came out. Yep. Now, scientists are, here's the thing. We like to put faith in science as this unbiased, um, unemotional, un- dispassionate method of investigation, right? But science, as great as it is as a tool for investigation, it's led by people, flawed human beings right. that are just as prone to groupthink and that are just as egoic, that have just as many biases as you and I, that um, are fiercely territorial, that have reputations to uphold, that have yeah. bills to pay, right? So this is really where science, I think, suffers, that there's a few bad apples in the bunch and science as a whole, the whole endeavor, I think, suffers as a result. And it's a big problem. That's why I totally disagree with the with the mantra to just trust the science, regardless of, you know, of all else to just blindly go with what authorities say because science is fallible because Mm -hmm. it's a human endeavor and humans are fallible. Right. And so basically what came out, the revelation that came out two weeks ago is that that 2006 paper was based on data that was completely fabricated. They never found this amyloid subtype that was responsible for cognitive impairment. Scientific groups have since tried to find it 
It was called AB Star 56. They were unable to find it. It was completely made up. And for 16 years, essentially, this paper was highly cited in tons of, of medical journals, right? By scientists that are just were continuing to push the status quo. It was responsible in part for this uh, aducanumab drug being approved by the FDA, despite experts saying that um, it, it had no real clinical benefit other than reducing the plaque burden in the brain. Right. But so what, right? It's not like there weren't side effects. So it's just been, uh, it's just, been, it, it's just been terribly sad because all these millions of dollars have continued to pour into this hypothesis, which is proven wrong, which was proved, you know, is continually proven wrong despite, you know, this, this horrible data, this fraudulent yeah. fake data. It's led to the, you know, the, obviously so much uh, misplaced hope, right? The, I mean, the patience of all the lost time yeah. where we could have been looking, you know, we could have been going down other avenues, putting more money to diet research, right? Nutrition research, right. lifestyle research. So super, super sad. So they, with the la the rats did not have improved or cognitive decline. Like what was fraudulent about it? Like what did they make up in the 2006 study? So it's possible that they, that they made it, they made all of that up okay. because what they basically did was they showed data on a, um, what's called a Western blot, which is a way mm -hmm. of, of illustrating data. So it's not numbers in a chart for people that don't know. It's basically, you're looking at like these graphical blots, literally, mm -hmm. um, that are thought to based on the, on the, on the, the, um, weight or boldness of the blot indicate higher or lower concentrations of a given protein. And those blots were completely faked. The, this Vanderbilt researcher who basically was the whistleblower Matthew Schrag, this guy, basically found evidence that they were, that some of the blots were copied over, that there were artifacts around the blot, clearly indicating a Photoshop copy paste job. Oh. Yeah. Because I mean, papers are subject to peer review, but the scientists are not like image sleuths. They're not going and zooming in and running the images that accompany papers through like image processing software to see yeah. that, that level of fraud. Like that just doesn't happen. There are independent web websites like PubPeer where individuals do that, but it really wasn't until this one researcher, Matthew Schrag, stepped forward and, and showed clearly, published in the, sci in the science article, that this was all, it was all faked. And other groups have since tried to find that protein, likely doesn't even exist. So it's not, it wasn't, the study wasn't able to be right. replicated. Right, so clearly this plaque is like not the bad guy. It's there for a reason. We got to find right. out why it's there. It's, it's obviously also correlated with aging. Um, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not causal. Interesting. There is a, um, another reason why I think it's become so another, another data point, um, as to why it has become the focus, um, over the years predating this 2006 paper is that there is a very small tiny subset sub uh cohort of alzheimer's patients that have early onset familial so a form of alzheimer's disease that's really a mutation um in this amyloid in this app gene that produces amyloid precursor protein mm -hmm. which is the foundation of the plaques and their brains just overproduce amyloid so it's kind of similar to um people might be familiar with familial hypercholesterolemia where they just overproduce dietary cholesterol but that's not um has no relationship, very little relationship with the vast majority of, of Alzheimer's cases. 99% of Alzheimer's cases um, are not attributable to any determinant gene. It's more of a diet and lifestyle interaction with genetic risk factors and the like. Um, so this amyloid story, I mean, it, it's, it, it needs to die. And I think this paper, this, this science revolution is like, a, was a bit really um, big step. Great news for anybody who's, who's um, you know, who has, uh, who's had a loved one with Alzheimer's disease. Um, but also, I mean, there is, there is a subsection of, of scientists and researchers and neurologists who from day one knew that amyloid wasn't the, right. wasn't the problem. Um, it's there at the scene of the crime again, but it's not what's causing it to be there. Yeah. Is the question. So the whistleblower two weeks ago, 
came forward and had its evidence as far as like how that study was fraudulent. What's happened since? Like has the scientist who conducted that 2006 paper? No come- response. No response. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a criminal matter. It should be. I mean, all this money oh, funding. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm pretty sure the Department of Justice will be looking into it. But as of now, to my not to my knowledge, there's been no response. Okay. And now being Thursday, yeah. August 4th. Yeah. But there has been so many instances like this, like throughout yeah. throughout history. I mean, it's just it's it's terrible. You know, and it's and it's hard to convey this without sowing distrust in the scientific yeah. method. But we all need to have a little bit more uh sort of like um, skepticism, I think, and and default back to culminate a, an, an internal compass of logic and reason and yeah, because you know science. I mean, there's there are bad apples. No, that brings up an interesting point as far as like you yourself, not a scientist, being able to look at a study or a paper and interpret it on your own. Because I think a lot of people think you have to have a science background to interpret a lot of that but a lot of it is just like the processes and like reading between the lines like i think we should do an episode on how to read a paper yeah i'd be down i mean i don't expect everybody to put in the kind of time that i've put in like i've dedicated my life to this you know like i I make a living like i'm 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 luckily able to do this every day i don't expect everybody to be able to put the kind of time and and effort in that i'm that i'm able to but um but no, you know, not asking people to take your job. Yeah, but I think, but I think to like, there is there is a lot that you can do and learn on your own. So, For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I think it's worth touching on this the chemical imbalance theory, um, which is another thing that came up. It's a lot shorter of a story. Okay. But basically, a paper came out, um, basically showing that so there's been this idea, uh, mostly um, perpetuated outside of the scientific and medical community that if you're depressed, you have lower levels of serotonin in your brain. But this paper that came out was an umbrella review and meta-analysis that found that there's no evidence that depressed people have lower levels of serotonin. Now, what this paper wasn't looking at was the efficacy of drugs. We know that that antidepressant drugs work for some. SSRIs work for some. So this is not to um, disparage the drugs and the people who are getting real benefit from them. Right. The efficacy of these drugs are mediated by the severity of the depression. So people that have more severe depression, the drugs are more effective for that population. The drugs seem to be not much more beneficial than a placebo for people with mild to moderate depression. And we know that they they tend to be overprescribed. And that I do want to point out from that's just taking the drug alone. Yeah. No therapy involved. Correct. Yeah. It's just like in these randomized control Mm -hmm. trials. Um. And so, but yeah, what they, this review looked at all of the available data on, you know, you know, what we know about serotonin and cerebrospinal fluid. There's not a ton of studies because it's pretty difficult to get cerebrospinal fluid from a human. It's just not, not many people are signing up for that experiment, but, um, but the, from the available data, there are, there is not lower levels of serotonin in the brain of people who are depressed compared to people who are not clinically depressed. There are what are called tryptophan depletion studies where they are able to reduce tryptophan availability in the brains uh, of people and they, they don't see depressive symptoms emerge when they do that. Um, and so this is really, uh, this wasn't, um, you know, whereas the Alzheimer's story was more fraudulent and, and nefarious, this is more just to kind of dispel the myth, I think, once and for all that um, is, is mainly held amongst the lay population that depression is caused by uh, lower levels of serotonin, which I think was always something that, at least to me, felt condescending and and had the potential to make people feel like they had, um, that they're that they're that they had like, that they were born with brains that were prone to depression, or that like right. that they had brains that were somehow um, less optimal, yeah, or uh, or more imperfect than and than other brains. We know that depression can be caused by a number of different things. We know that there's the inflammatory cytokine model of depression. So inflammation can, can, um, create feelings of depression. We know that, uh, if something bad happens in your life, you can, it can create feelings of depression. So, um, yeah, your brain's not broken is I think the, one of the more empowering takeaways from this, uh, from this new review. 
Interesting. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. You know, fats are a very clean burning fuel source to the brain. The brain can continue to use fat even um, in certain disease states, um, like, like Alzheimer's disease.